anyway. There's no yeah, nickname yeah. for Columbus. There's, what do people call you for short? You can't really like make a nickname out of your name. You know? That is, listen, that is it. You know, my dad was not a lover of nicknames, but I told you a story about my son, didn't I? We're live now though. Can you tell the story? I can tell the story. I, I don't know if he'll appreciate it or not, but. Right. <laughs> Let me just introduce you guys. I would love to hear that because that's what's fun about the show sometimes is just hearing some personal things. But first I want to welcome everyone to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. This is part two of Liberation Nutrition with Dr. Columbus Batiste and Dr. Eric Walsh. They were both amazing speakers on the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. You can still watch today until midnight for free, both of their wonderful presentations. Before we went live, Dr. Batiste's name is Columbus, and I've never known anyone with that name. And I said, but you can't really have a nickname with Columbus. And you can't, right? <laughs> no, you can't. But first, thank you for having us on the show again. Yes. We love, love, love every time we have a chance to kind of sit down and speak with you. And you're all glammed up. I feel as if I'm underdressed right now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I mean, I, I, I love it. You always look great, but today it's yeah. like you put well, a little something extra on it. It is pretty and pink. I have a, a presentation after this for Linda Middlesworth, Get Healthy Sacramento, an event you actually spoke at one year. And so that's why I just have to go from here to there. But thank you so much. But yeah, Eric, there's no nickname to Eric either, really. What you can't do my, my, my nickname growing up was Ricky. <laughs> Still two syllables, so it doesn't shorten it, but yeah. yeah you, can't, you can't really go columbus -y, you know what I mean? No. Like, you can't call you bus or Cubs. No, not at all, not at all. And so, yeah, my dad was real proud and was not about nicknames whatsoever. Um, I, what I started to tell you is that my son's nickname now is, he, he says CJ. I don't know exactly what CJ means, if it's Columbus Jr. since he's a third, but he actually was born Bryce Collin Batiste. And, my, and what's interesting is that my wife uh, started off by saying, listen, I'm going to, I'll, I'm going to name him after you and your dad to kind of carry on the tradition. And so my dad was ecstatic over the idea. I wasn't as big. I was like, you know what? It's fine. Name's a name. I'm good either way. And um, so we ended up, but she changed her mind and said, you know, we're going to go down the road of Bryce. And so I was like, okay, I like Bryce. I like Colin. And so we named him Bryce. It was a great name, strong name, I felt. But he always asked me, you know, dad, why is my, why, how come I'm not named after you? And so at the age of 11, he's now 14, he pressed and pressed and pressed until we folded and he wanted to change his name. So he changed his name. We took him down to the courthouse to change his name to Columbus Dennis Batiste III. Um, but he goes by CJ is his name now. So anyway, a long story, but that, that's, that's a nickname. I, I don't think I'm going to adopt CJ. <laughs> but <laughs> did you, did, how, how was that name growing up? Did, 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 did people say, oh, did you discover America? You know what? It's crazy. It wasn't, I didn't get that. I don't know if I went to school with some maybe less intelligent people, but they're <laughs> extremely successful and extremely bright, but they never teased me once. It wasn't until, until I started dating, you know, which of course that took a long time. I was a late bloomer, but until I started dating, then the, the parents would sit there saying stuff uh, to me. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one of these things you grow into. It's a love or hate name and I own it because it's mine. I'm not changing my name. So it's, it's, it's good. Yeah. What, what made your mom name you Columbus? Did you ever ask her? My dad's name is Columbus. Oh, but that's why. Okay. Yes. Well, what made his mother name him Columbus? Uh, he's the last of about nine or 10 kids. And so the older ones were studying Columbus and they were like, hey, let's name him Columbus. And so his mom was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's name him Columbus. And so well, it was Colum Columbus Dennis Batiste and that, that was that. Well, I like it because it's unique and no one will ever forget you for sure. You yeah. can't forget Well, thank that. you. Thank well, you. Thank this, you. This is interesting because Maria, who's watching live, said, I would love to hear if the doctors have any collaboration with the work of Dr. Kim Williams and the work Rush is doing in reaching out to the African-American community. I don't know the answer to that, but both of these doctors are reaching out to the African-American community with their YouTube channel, Slave Food, which I'm asking you guys to please subscribe to. So you can answer that. Well, let me jump in and say not just the African-American community, but Africans, people of African descent and diaspora around the world have been tuning in. Last night, late, um, I spoke for a group, um, actually yesterday afternoon, I spoke for a group in South Africa, um, predominantly in South Africa, but um, and really brought a lot of these this information to that group, a lot of um, the same information. What's happening in Africa is that much of the... Um, westernization of the diet 
that we have seen here in the States is beginning to go into those countries as they develop. So South Africa, of course, has a lot of uh, kind of fast food joints and stuff. Um, but even when I was in Ghana, there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, across from one of the um, office buildings that we went to visit. And I started to really notice more and more of them. Same thing in the Caribbean. So the message that we have is going to become more and more global as people actually give up more whole food plant-based indigenous diets to try and eat the food they see in American movies and on American TV. Yeah. What's interesting. That, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, I mean, that's the problem that we see around the world is this westernization, this globalization of disease that really extends from, from our American culture. And it's problematic because we, you know, we have to really get back to the idea of kind of eating like a pauper. I mean, you know, in these indigenous, these countries, you know, the simple, easy things to eat that are affordable are the things that are whole food plant-based. I never forget kind of working with someone not of African descent, but someone of, of Latino descent. And he was concerned. He had transitioned towards a whole food plant-based diet, had completely transformed his whole entire cardiometabolic profile, a nurse dropped his, his cholesterol, no longer was diabetic, his blood pressure normalized, off his meds. He was going back to take care of his parents in Mexico. And he was like, gosh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm going to eat, like I, the way I've been eating. And so anyway, when he got back, I told him, listen, don't, 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 don't worry about it. You know what? Do the best you can. Let's eat and try and focus because he couldn't carry things with him. He got back and he said, you know what, doc? I didn't realize growing up, we couldn't afford all that stuff. And he said, there weren't like all these fast food restaurants around. It was really easy for me to eat plant-based when I was back home taking care of my parents. He said, because those were the simple staples that we ate growing up that I didn't even realize. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of power in eating the simple foods and eating like a pauper to live like a king. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because you're a cardiologist. Today is February, it's February 28th. It's the last day of the month. So it's Heart Health Month. It's Black History Month. How do those things intersect? <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's, listen, Heart Health Month affects, or I should say heart disease affects every single clinician around the world. If you're a physician, if you're a nurse practitioner, it's something that all of us will face and interact with. Um, Dr. Walsh, I'm sure, faces it every, uh, frequently inside of his urgent care clinic as well. But this intersection is it's, it's huge. What we know is that we know heart disease is indeed the number one killer of all Americans and specifically those of African descent and African women. But what's so unique about this blend between heart health and between nutrition is that the Western diet, just like what uh, Eric was just mentioning, this, the, I should say the African diet was seeded in the plant-rich foods, plant-rich plant-based foods is what we know that that was the predominance and these superfoods really they abound in Africa it's not something that's just kind of uh by the way it's like scientists have really developed have shown really an excessive amount of the phytonutrients and some of the power that's there and some of the early studies of the early 20th century from missionaries going about they really kind of de uh, detected the fact that there was an absence of coronary artery disease in many villages and in many of these missionary-based hospitals, which really speaks to the power of the simplistic approach that's here that we have to get back to. Right. Well, I remember hearing about Dr. Dennis Birkin at the GI Health mm -hmm. Summit, how when he went to, I guess it was Uganda, like he couldn't, like the only mm -hmm. time he found like any disease was in somebody from, that, that was there from, from Britain, somebody that was English. Like he couldn't find breast cancer. He couldn't find colon cancer. He couldn't find anything. Yeah, that, that's, that's the power. You look at that fiber, right? You look at that fiber rich richness of the food that's there that it was being ingested on a regular basis and these plant-rich foods it's no doubt the fact that you aren't finding you aren't finding uh, colon cancer and you aren't finding some of these western diseases that really are pervasive in our culture yeah so i remember hearing that the microbiome of children in africa is so much better than the microbiome of the kids in the united states yeah, when you look at that diversity, you know, I'm not sure if uh, I'm not, I hope, hopefully I'm getting this signal that my internet connection is unstable. So I'm not sure if you're able to hear me or if, if uh, Eric is too as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, when you look at the diversity of the microbiome, that's such a key important thing right now. And what these studies are telling us is that the more diverse your microbiome, which means that you're eating different food substances that are plant derived, that are fiber rich, that can allow the di diversification. It even, it even dovetails into COVID, 
you know, in the studies showing that the more diverse your microbiome is, the less impactful the COVID will be on you, meaning that you're not going to have the intensive care visits and other aspects there. But Eric, I know Eric's visited uh, Africa and, and probably <laughs> has directly. I have not as of yet. Well, I mean, it, it's like it's, it's very similar to what you described with the person who went back to Mexico. The foods are often simple. They can grow them themselves. Um, and the markets where you do find the farmers markets and they don't even call them farmers markets. They're just, they're just the markets. And I remember being in Ghana and just the rich spread of fruits, vegetables, it was just overwhelming. And that is what people eat. I mean, that's, that's their basic food. They cook it up certain ways. Obviously as they Westernize more and more animal products are added to foods because it, you know, they, they, you know, some of them, I don't know if they're doing the mass production at, like we do here in the States, uh, but far more, but as important, if not more important, it really is the is the the the, um, the influx of fast food joints and junk food, um, and I, I you know and you know so you start seeing in Africa more like European style candies and candy bars and that kind of stuff starts to starts to uh, make its presence known. Um, but obviously, in these kids, when you talk about the the, the diversity of their microbiome, this is something that will impact them for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, having the best um, microbiome is going to do so many good things for them. Work to be anti-inflammatory, obviously, and um, decrease risks of even um, uh, 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 GI diseases. And so the kids get kind of a benefit from that that we often don't see here. And as we learn more and more about the um, gut microbiome, you know, we're learning, you know, every day it seems like there's something new. Like I just read something that said they just discovered 70,000 viruses that um, are also in the gut microbiome that no one knows what it does yet. Um, mm. So we're gonna, I think we're gonna be learning so much more about this um, in the near future. Um, and what we do know fortunately is to, to Columbus's point, uh, fiber is really important. And uh, the difference between those indigenous diets and ours to a great extent is the amount of fiber. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking because it's Black History Month can you guys talk about some of the prominent African Americans throughout history that have been vegan that people might not even like, like Rosa Parks, like she she's my hero just in general, but like she was vegan. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what, what I'm learning. I mean, that was one of the interesting things to me is as I started looking and, and some of the things that were being said is that there is a direct link between the actions of civil rights or fighting for equality of all people of women, of different ethnic groups and various things of just equality, not for more, but just for equal treatment. And between the same issue that dovetails into food justice and to saying, let's, let's have equal, let's have be, be uh, ethical to our animals, for our environment and for our lives and for our health, which is most important. And so when you look at the likes of, of, of Rosa Parks, like you mentioned, when you look at the likes of Coretta Scott King, the wife of, of slain Martin Luther King and all the work that he did, that they did uh, collectively, of their son, Dexter King, too, as well. When you look at the lights of, of Angela Davis from the Black Panther uh, Party mm -hmm. and, and, and the work that they did, even in trying to make sure that kids had food kind of going in in their early lunches, uh, breakfast programs and so forth. When you look at the likes of Dick Gregory, you know, the, the term, you know, he's one of your compadres as a comedian, but then turned into a, a, a civil rights activist and really equally staunch in terms of his of his lifestyle. Look at the likes of, of Al Sharpton, who's adopted dietary shifts that are more plant rich. You look at the likes of Cory Booker, our current yeah, U.S. Corey senator, Booker is right? Phenomenal. Yeah, you know, and and really not just understanding and marrying in intimately this relationship between the role of nutrition and between our um, our health outcomes, our social outcomes, and really the aspect that you know more people are dying from from drive-ins than they are from drive-bys inside of these community, our communities and so forth. The likes of, of Cicely Tyson and Alice Walker, the author of, of The Color Purple. Um, and, you know, Cicely Tyson was nearly a raw vegan looking as if she was about 30 years younger than she was before she passed away. Um, so there's, there's power. This is not a new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that it has been embedded within the, our culture for many decades, many decades and longer. And I, I'd throw in there that um, Dick Gregory, uh, when you look at uh, some of his um, material on this subject, he was one of the first people I saw tie um, uh, civil rights, uh, human rights to diet. 
he really um, overwhelmingly emphasized this importance and tried to really shake African Americans uh, up to understand that, in fact, you you can be just as chained by your food as you can by any political system. And because he was a comedian, he really crafted some amazing statements around that. So he was very good. Um, I, I definitely want to echo Cicely Tyson. I think if you go and look at her, the, 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 the um, breadth of her work as an actress um, and how long she was able to keep playing parts. I just saw uh, I, I'm, The Help not that long ago again. And she's in that movie. And I said, but she, she was working almost all the way up to right to the end. And it's partly because she had the kind of diet that would allow her to do that. Um, but I do want to throw in somebody that wasn't mentioned, and that is Bob Marley. Um, yes. When you look at yes. um, a lot yes. of the reggae singers, are Rastafarians, and the Rastafarian religion uh, follows the biblical diet. And um, I had a really good friend who was Jewish when I was living in California, and he said, uh, any, uh, if you really look at it, the, the most, most clean, profound way to be kosher is actually to ho- have a whole food plant-based diet. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And um, he says, then you can get that from the Torah. And it's the same concept, same principle that the Rastafarians basically follow. So Bob Marley, and I know I'm friends with some of his kids, um, they to this day, over most of them, really do hold on to um, a whole food plant-based diet. And I give them a lot of props because um, when you go to Jamaica, it's actually not difficult because of that Rastafarian movement to find whole food plant-based restaurants. And they do not make food like we, even our vegan restaurants don't make food like they do. They have something called Ito stew, where they mix up a bunch of vegetables and root foods, sometimes in a curry base and sometimes in some other bases, that is just so delicious and so nutritious. So it's it, culturally, this is really a part of um, Black history and Black culture. You know, I think when, when we have athletes, it helps so much because I don't know what it's like in the African-American community. Do they feel like the men that it's not manly to eat vegetables? So like when we see like John Sally or Carl Lewis, then it's like, oh, well, then maybe it's okay. Well, I think definitely. It, oh, go ahead, Columbus. So you were, Columbus was in the documentary on this. Um, not, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, that, that, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't blink, otherwise you'll miss it. But no, that, that number one is incredible. It's really about it's really about tailoring the story that can can craft into to people's interests, and I think that that's such a salient point for men in general, both African American men and men in general, is this idea of you have to eat meat in order to be strong and to be healthy. That it's something that's a, a an issue of vitality, which is a complete falsehood. I think one of the things that's become like John the John Sallys, the Carl Lewis, those were trailblazers, to be honest with you, inside of the athletic area now. I think now as we're seeing this increase in technology is increasing and awareness is increasing, we're seeing this now extend out to multiple basketball players, to football players. Um, there, Memphis, and, the and Memphis, um, what was Tennessee the football Titans. team? The Tennessee, Tennessee Titans, Titans, yeah. Derek, Derek Morgan and his wife, Charity, and how they really helped transform uh, that, that group there. And many of them are still vegan or plant-based. Even Cam Newton was, was, uh, had gone vegan or trans, 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 transitioned towards that. You have many of our uh, basketball players, Kyrie Irving, and and um, you know many of the others have started moving towards plant based too as well. So it's becoming something that's becoming more the norm as they look at the benefits from inflammation from a recovery standpoint. You know what's interesting is that I I recently listened to and you should take a listen to it, uh, Chef AJ too as well, to Cory Booker. So he was interviewed on um, actually at church broadcast, uh, Oakwood University Church. Um, and one of the interesting things about that was that he really highlighted his effect mm-hmm. as an athlete, that when he was playing football at Stanford and when he transitioned towards eating healthfully for the purpose of animals and environmental was the main issue at that time. What he found quickly was the fact that his recovery is by leaned out. He was able to perform equally, if not better. When we spoke with John Sally, he talked about the mental clarity in terms of decision making. You know, that we hear repeatedly that every, everyone kind of experiences, but from an athletic standpoint, that's huge. That's huge. One of the things that when I was growing up, they said it was so what that was uh, portrayed as an incredibly manly way thing to eat if you wanted to get big and muscular was eggs. And I remember <laughs> in high school, kids would like just crack in the weight room, crack two eggs in a cup, and maybe they'd mix some milk or something in it, and they just guzzle down two raw eggs as a way to get quick protein to get bigger yeah. muscles. Um, and that was viewed as manly. 
Um, so I, I, I don't know if people still do that. I sure hope not. But um, <laughs> isn't it interesting that for, so for, so uh, it, is, in, in the African American community, one of the biggest kind of plagues is prostate cancer in black men. And when I found out, when I was considering whether or not, because I, I really do enjoy, I did enjoy eggs when I used to eat it. One of I was trying to figure out should I give up eggs. This was a big thing because eggs were breakfast on basically on mostly on Sunday mornings. But um, you know, if you were, if you ever went to IHOP for dinner, if you ever went, you know, you got an omelet, if you go to Denny's or whatever. And I remember sitting at my desk. This is probably about seven years ago, and I was saying, should I give up eggs? You know, uh, and uh, two research studies came across my desk very quickly afterwards. One of them that said eating, and I forget how many eggs a week, is the equivalent of smoking like a half a pack of cigarettes a day for cardiovascular um, demise. And I was like, whoa. I mean, I had prayed about it. Should I really give up eggs? The other study that came out was one that showed the increased risk of prostate cancer. Um, in fact, the last data I saw was like, there's as much as an 80% increase in prostate cancer risk if you're, depending on how much eggs you eat a week, but, but, but eating eggs. This isn't told. I mean, we, we, we push black men to go get um, digital rectal exams earlier, maybe get PSAs. I know they keep oscillating back and forth whether or not a PSA is any good. Obviously, if they find anything, you got to go in and get biopsy, a, pro a piece of your prostate removed, pinched out in a biopsy. And if all else fails and, they, and you actually get diagnosed with prostate cancer, they can actually remove your prostate, cause impotence, cause um, incontinence. I mean, it's a major life change. And I am still blown away at how little anyone has ever told that eggs may honestly be one of the key contributing factors to prostate cancer when it affects so many black men. And, in, and I think in Jamaican men, it might even be worse. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of work for Black History Month. You know, when you start to look at the social activism and what should come next, you got to start asking some really hard questions like, when are we going to really be honest with people about what increases disease risk? When are doctor's offices going to be almost not required, but when are they going to be at least educated to say, look, yeah, you might want to get your prostate checked early if you're a black man, but maybe when you're in your, in your teens or even as a child, your parents should be told, listen, limit the amount of egg intake in order to later on decrease the risk of prostate cancer or, or remove it from your diet altogether. That's not happening. And it's really sad. Um, it's like vitamin D and coronavirus. We, there's a lot of good evidence now that having, you know, very good uh, vitamin D levels can protect against COVID. But no one is saying it. They're saying now to take put on two masks. Yet I do not hear these kind of messages to protect people. And until we get to the point where we trust people, what they tell you is, you're, you know, we can't tell people not to eat eggs. Who's going to ever stop eating eggs? That's the excuse they use. But to me, that is a that is that is like. Um, treating people like as if they're, they're, they're buffoons. Like you're not smart enough to make an intelligent decision about what you eat. And this is kind of like the new activism. This is where I think we're going to have to go is empowering people with the information and then the resources to act on the information to protect them from these diseases. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, tonight is the Golden Globe ceremonies and Chadwick Boseman is, is nominated posthumously. And, you know, that was a wake up call, wasn't it? That somebody that young oh, yes. guy of colon cancer. Oh. Definitely. And we don't know the whole story. So, you know, I, I don't, I can't say what he did or didn't do. Um, you know, but I would say that clearly the standard American diet, the slave food that we call soul food that many of us as African Americans eat would increase our risk. I know a black man who in their early thirties have had to have um, you know, the, the last third of their colon removed because they've had colon, either either colon cancer or um, serious abscesses or so forth into the colon. So yeah, it, it is a very scary thing when people are dying that young from a disease that was once considered the disease of the old. Yeah. And when you look at colon cancer in general, I mean, you know, that's one of the things you tend to think of it as a disease of the old, but also from a standpoint of, from a symptom standpoint, most folks are not going in to get their colonoscopy. They're not, most folks probably aren't even looking at their stools when they, when they, after they use the, the bathroom at all. And so you can imagine how this can fester from the food products that they're eating that are carcinogenic, that they may never be aware that they're even predisposed to it. And that's one of the key things is this predisposition. And it's, and although we say distinctly, your DNA is not your destiny, destiny, we do know that your, your lifestyle does impact your epigene and this epigene can be transmitted generationally. 
And so the whether or not we're looking at a combination of stress of discrimination that can impact uh, the epigenes that can then make one tilt the, the scale towards disease that now is inflamed by your nutritional practices. And because of the fact that whether or not it's access to healthcare, whether or not it's an issue of fear of the healthcare system, whether or not it's an issue, whatever the issues are, that now you're not even having the checks and balances to have some level of understanding where your risks fall and you're being fed misinformation and the availability. And it's just a perfect setup of why we have such stark disparities, not just within the African-American community, but when you look at America in general, compared to other um, Western European countries, we see that we, we fail miserably despite our technology, despite all these things. And so we could talk forever about the bad stuff, but I think the good news is the fact that there is hope that people can make a change through like the work you're doing and that we're trying to do and tailor specifically to the community. And people are, sh are shifting. We're seeing this shift. Stays are, are showing the shift towards a vegan lifestyle uh, for many of African descent. You know, Dr. Milton Mills talks about how the USDA dietary guidelines are racially biased. Do you think that most people of African descent, whether they're here or in another country, know that they're not supposed to drink milk? They, they really can't even digest it? I, I don't think so. Um, and I would say just from my own experiences growing up, I had a very, very smart mother who I watched her get her single mother. I watched her get her associate's degree, her bachelor's degree and her master's degree. Um, she, she worked really hard, but we were given, uh, we would go through a gallon of milk with her three boys every two, three days, probably growing up. Um, the three of us, I mean, between our cereal and our cup of milk after, after school. Um, so she didn't know. And we were always, in hindsight, we were always sick. We always, in Connecticut, had runny nose, basically runny nose and cough and, not cough, runny nose and kind of uh, sinusy congestion, these type symptoms. And the, in fact, we wound up, we lived close to the school, but the, our pediatrician actually got us the bus to keep us out of the cold. He got us mm -hmm. a bus ride. We, we lived probably less than a mile from the school <laughs> uh, because we, you know, we were just always stuffy and, and congested and runny nose. And when I gave up dairy products, it was like within a few weeks, I've, I've, I've never had that problem since. And I, and I, you know, going back to probably my early 20s. So, uh, you know, not, again, it goes back to this, not telling people some of this stuff. If you're lactose intolerant, what we may find out later on is that that's just a marker for the fact that there are other aspects of dairy products you cannot metabolize or that are uh, extra pro-inflammatory um, to your system other than other people. Yeah. And just and just to chime in, you know, I mean, some of those listening out there may say, OK, well, how is dairy racist or why is this kind of being this statement being made? And so not speaking for, for Milton Mills at all. But as I think about this out loud, we realize that such a substantial portion of, of, of ethnic minorities are lactose intolerant. So when we look at Asians, we look at at, um, at indigenous individuals, we look at those of African descent. Have, are substantially lactose intolerant, which means you don't process it very well, which means it can lead to a lot of gastrointestinal issues and so forth that are there. But then yet the guidelines are ignoring that segment of the population. And they're saying, no, eat. this is what you need to eat. This is what you need to have on your plate. It's saying that you don't matter. It's what that suggests. It suggests that you don't matter. And if I take it to another level, it's actually saying, well, we're going to ignore the data that suggests the ill consequences to the health of all human beings. And we're still going to say, this is something that you should have because of macronutrients of saying protein or saying uh, that this, in that I'm going to revel in, in, in macronutrients and saying, well, get your protein from dairy and that's how you're gonna get your protein and say, looking at the overall picture and saying, okay, this is what happens to you as an effect from this particular source of protein, as well as its impact on on, on the animals, as well as this impact on the environment. You know, I'm Jewish here, so we're lactose intolerance too. I'm actually allergic yeah. to milk. And it, it, to me, dairy is the biggest triumph of marketing over science of pretty much even, even more than olive oil. <laughs> and I was listening to a lecture at the Get Healthy Sacramento event that's currently on live right now. So I'm opposite Dr. McDougal, so I got a lot of competition for this live. But <laughs> Roseanne Alviera, Dr. Alviera was giving a talk about habit change 
And she was talking about it's better to just change one habit at a time. And maybe we could just start a campaign on that because nobody needs dairy anyway. But 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 like you say, I the people that I know that are African American, they don't know this. They don't know that they can't even digest it. Maybe there could be some awareness because we can't change everything at once. We can't have everybody go vegan overnight. It would be nice, but maybe just go with that angle, say, listen. This particular animal product, this is not for you, you know, and explain why. Maybe you could just start there. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's, deep, it's deep, though, too, as well, because, I mean, I think African-Americans know they don't tolerate it, but they're used to it as a norm. You know, people oftentimes are used, so used to feeling sick and living sick that they think it's normal. So I'm used to, after I have a big plate of macaroni and cheese, that my stomach may get a little gassy. I may have, you know, have the runs or whatever it may be, but I still eat it. I may feel this way after eating pizza or whatever the cheesy mm -hmm. substance is and just feel like this is normal. Everyone experiences this and not realizing that there's, there's another way, but then also understanding the fact that it's bombarded down their throats as being normal. So they're hearing conflicting information and that's why you're right. We have to have this massive campaign because when you have the, you have the dairy company, uh, I was watching the Super Bowl the Super Bowl. I'm watching NFL Network right before the Super Bowl, and they're getting on talking about get stay active. And then the next statement was like, you know what? And get your milk. So then that way you can have strong, you can be strong. And they right. and then they hired they transitioned immediately. This is in 2021. Hmm. 2021, this was still being said and still being thrown out by the NFL yeah. network. And it was very disheartening to see that this is the level that happens from our kids all the way up. And that's why there's so much misinformation out there. So you're right. We do have to have a campaign to change things. Well, well dairy was never part of the traditional African diet, right? No, I mean, no. maybe there was some meat, but there was no dairy. There was no, no. cheese. Well, there's nowhere to store it uh, for most folk. You know, you, you need a refrigerator. So you, it mm -hmm. would be difficult to actually store it, which is why a lot of the world never really didn't eat it. Um, but one of the things about dairy that is interesting is that you develop, you do, you, your body will begin to try and make the enzyme again. So you, if you, if you force it in long enough, it will become more palatable, or should I, say, I should say, tolerable over time. Now, but it goes back to what I said before. What if this intolerance is just a marker for the fact that this thing causes other problems? You know, um, so if we force it down, we can manage it, but we're actually going against a warning system that our body has to tell us you really shouldn't be eating this. And that is also my fear that eventually we find out that there are other things. And we already have found out some of those things. We know what casein from cow's milk does. Casein from cow's milk is a cancer promoter. So again, you, you step back and you say, you know, let's, you know, it's Black History Month. We want African-Americans to do better, live better, on and on and on. But if you are drinking lots of milk and you add in the fact that in, our, in some of our talks, we talk about how racial discrimination, the stress of racial discrimination, in, um, for those women who report that they've experienced racial discrimination, Black women, they have increased risk um, and, uh, and rates of, of breast cancer. So if that's the case and stress is doing that, and now you pour on the gasoline of cow's milk casein, you know what I mean? We, maybe we, we're like doubling, we're actually uh, synergizing the effect of a lot of the stressors that uh, uh, African-Americans in America uh, have to deal with. So pulling back from the dairy then becomes a way to, to actually protect yourself against um, some of the stressors that are unique to black people in America. Yeah. Yes. You know, one of the things I oftentimes will say when patients come in and they'll complain, they'll have chest pain, they'll have shortness of breath, they'll have whatever the symptoms are, right? I'll let them know clearly. The only difference between you and everyone else inside this hospital, everyone else inside the world is that you know you have a problem and the rest of us don't. That means you automatically get a trigger that you need to be intentional in doing something about it. And so Eric is absolutely right. We have to learn to listen to our bodies. And as we force feed ourselves certain substances that we know we don't feel well with, that we know that, hey, listen, I feel sluggish after eating this large amount of meat and processed foods, or I feel gassy and disruptive after eating the dairy. You have to listen to your body and say, you know what, maybe it's a better way not to go this direction. Maybe I have to change and shift and truly listen that to your body and being in tune. And I'm a Oh, go ahead. Oh, please go ahead. I, I can get to I was just, just going to throw real quick. I, I've gone out with friends who are avid meat eaters. I have one family that I, I, I grew, kind of grew up with in Miami, went to the same school, same church, and um, their family ate the most meat. I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody eat more meat mm -hmm. than them. 
they had like a freezer in the garage just full of meat. By that time, I was vegetarian, so I, I'd go over there and basically have nothing. If I went over to their house, it's like I'd be eating rice and salad. Like, there's nothing to eat. And um, I remember years later taking, going to dinner with one of the sons. Who now, you know, I was a, a successful professional. We went to a, um, a vegan restaurant in Atlanta, and he ordered what I don't remember what he ordered. And when we left, out, you know, this is a guy who every meal he eats tons of meat. He said, I can't believe how different I feel. One meal, and he was like, I feel lighter. I'm like, I feel like a, I don't feel sleepy. I got, I feel, and he just went on and on. And I said, if, it, ask yourself, as adamant as you are about eating meat, should you still eat meat if this, if one meal makes you feel this much better? Mm-hmm. Just one meal of years. And of course, in their family, there's a lot of cancer and a lot of disease, a lot of diabetes, a lot, a lot of chronic diseases. But I'll never forget him saying that. And, I, and I, I said to myself, if you get that much of an impact from one meal that you enjoyed, why would you continue on the path you're on? Well, probably because they're addicted to some of the foods. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm guessing. Yep, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So here's a fun question from Angela. Are, are any of your coworkers influenced by your choice of diet and lifestyle? I can say yes. It's taken a while. So I, you know, as an interventional cardiologist, I was apprehensive of joining the whole fray of, of telling patients about it only from the standpoint of it wasn't as commonplace as it is now. It's m- becoming much more popular than when I started out. And so I stayed with my intention. And so what's interesting is that majority of the cardiologists began to discuss nutrition, whether or not they completely adopted it or not. Many would reference and say, okay, well, you, if you're listening to Dr. Batisi, he'd tell you to do this. But what I think the greatest uh, enjoyment I've received is that we brought in a new colleague and a new interventional cardiologist. And so, you know, we'd have these discussions, scientific discussions and debates over, is it valid or is it not? And he finally decided to, to give it a try. And he came to me sheepishly and it was like, man, Columbus, I really don't want to tell you this, but I feel better. And it's not as hard as what it was. And, and he was like, yeah, I, you know, I think it is the right thing to do. And, and so, yeah, I think, we have to be an example. We have to be a light out there and be able to step out uh, and do what we do in a loving, empathetic, and being empathizing with others as much as possible. So I didn't beat over their heads, but I was pretty definitive. I joke them like, oh man, you guys are cardiologists and this is what you're having for lunch. I'm like, come on, you guys are trying to give me more business. And when when the leadership, the leadership would come over, I would say like, oh, you're bringing donuts? I was like, oh, let me shake your hand. I checked their pulse. I said, well, you're keeping a good pulse for me to go ahead and, and work on you in the future. And they joke. But what's interesting is I get these. Now I'm getting these messages from some of the high up leaders. They're saying, hey, are you still teaching the classes? I know it's COVID. I have a colleague and another leader who's interested in attending your class. I said, you don't have to wait for a class. Just just email me and I'll give you some I'll give you some words of advice. So there's power in the in, in being an example. There is power in being an example. But Dr. Walsh, I believe you were critical care. So do you get to influence colleagues at all? Because it's, it's a little bit different because you're not seeing the same patient over and over. Yeah, in urgent care, we don't. But we do, from a colleague standpoint, it actually does. When I was, I was working in Bakersfield, California, um, which is, for California, it's like the Texas of California. <laughs> so um, much less vegan options in terms of, you know, restaurants or stuff like that up there. A le- much less of a vegan crowd than when I lived in L.A. or Orange County or even in the Inland Empire, to, to really. Um, but I remember when we they were doing, like, weight loss challenges and stuff at the clinic. Um, and, you know, they that's when many of them found that a whole food plant-based diet actually gave them an advantage. And I saw many of them who were pretty avowed meat eaters really cut down and start um, eating more whole food and plant-based. Um, I think uh, what, what Columbus said is right. I mean, you have to be an example. You have to you have to be kind in this as well, um, because people will sometimes just hold their ground just because they don't want to be wrong, and it doesn't really matter if they're right or wrong. It's just they don't want to appear wrong. But um, Many, I think people are often influenced. I definitely would say a lot of patients are, are influenced. When you make the case to patients that, listen, you don't have to be a diabetic. There is a road out of being a diabetic. And here's, what, here's how you get started on that road. A lot of patients are actually willing to try it because they really don't like the, you know, they, they're, they're very concerned that they want to have to get an amputation or have a heart attack. So a lot of, or go on dialysis. So a lot of people will actually listen um, and try some of these things. 
So yeah, and that, and that's, that's amazing with the patients, right? So I remember talking with this, this patient of mine, and I'm seeing that he's not that old. He's, he's in his late 40s and had heart failure, had some other issues. And so I just started really kind of getting at into the, the nitty gritty. After we worked through his meds and everything, I said, listen, I'm just meeting you for the first time. It's via video. I said, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about ways in which you can prevent it. I started breaking down to him the components of eating a whole food plant-based diet and the power in terms of transformative power for him. And what was interesting is that he's the next football player, <laughs> a professional football player. I did had no idea. And uh, because the video wasn't working and he's related to many great athletes who play the game even today, as well as in years gone by in the past. And he was willing to give it a try. He told me that after he accepted the challenge, as I was telling him, listen, I'm gonna be your coach. I'm gonna say, my job is to sit here and say like, oh, you're doing okay. So my job is to beat you up and tell you you can be better than what you're being than what you were just being. And, um, and so we have to give people the opportunity. If we assume that they're not capable of it, that they're unwilling to accept it, they will never accept it because we never offer it to them. And that's our biggest, I think, challenge as, as, as healthcare providers in general. Neat. So here's an interesting question from Elizabeth. How do we find if we have underlying heart disease early before it's full blown? You know, like with colonoscopy, there's screening. Are, are there routine screenings for heart disease? So the routine screens for heart disease don't work. The best bet that what you can do is know the risk factors. Heart disease is like the massive villain and it runs with a series of accomplices that will point you to who the villain is. Diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, other things, your weight to as well. All these things play a significant um, aspect in it. Now, certainly there are arbitrary screenings. There's things like calcium score from a CT scan, there's stress tests, but they don't tell you truly in predictive absolutely of your risk of a heart attack, which is really your greatest concern. They tell us if you have markers of coronary artery disease, which then will lead us down the pathway of giving you likely the average healthcare provider a statin therapy, you're going to be placed on aspirin potentially if you don't have risk of, uh, against it and looking once again at blood pressure. And then there's an arbitrary mention of lifestyle. So if you employ the lifestyle right now, find out immediately what your risk factors are if you have them, your A1C for diabetes, your blood pressure, know your weight, um, know your cholesterol levels. Those are the key staples for trying to offset coronary artery disease. Yeah. Now, Dr. Walsh, in urgent care, can you always, like, I, like with heart disease, you can really make the correlation with the diet, but like you might be seeing somebody for a sprained ankle or a burn or something, but can you find a way to like get this into almost every patient? You, you absolutely can. Um, so sometimes if they're young teenagers and stuff, and I talk to them about what it does for skin, um, you know, and how they'll look, um, long-term weight management. So some of the younger people are already kind of have their ears um, open to they, what they would say is a vegan lifestyle for all of the kind of environmental and um, animal kind of protection reasons. So you can give them some of the, the health reasons and a lot of people will kind of listen. For older people, when they come into urgent care, a lot of times they're, they're, they're kind of using us for their primary care doctor when they really should go see their primary care doctor. So they'll be on a ton of medications. And this is when you can often say, listen, you are, you know, I'm seeing you. I didn't prescribe these medications, but I do want you to know that there are some, have you, have you ever discussed with your doctor things you can do to get off of some of these meds? And for a lot of people, that's enough. If they hear that, they, 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 that's enough to get them motivated to want to listen. And then I, oftentimes what I can do, because I don't have a lot of time and I, it's not primary care, I send them back out to look at certain documentaries. I'll write them down. Um, people like you, I'll tell them about, you know, like go, find Chef AJ, go look for her programming, go online and listen to some of the shows and, and things like that. So, and one of the reasons we do the Slave Food Project is when we, when we talk, when you talk to African-American patients, there's a lot less catered to them around the foods they like to eat in that culture. Um, and so this, that's partly what we do to, to try and make it relevant for that, for our community. Um, and hopefully, like I said, when we do our, if we, when and when we do our docu-series, we'll actually have our own docu-series and say, hey, go watch this. And it'll walk you through the, 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 the history, the whys and the hows of a whole food plant-based diet. When you say the foods they like to eat, what, what are those foods? Because maybe I can learn to make recipes that would be more appealing. I, I, oh, yeah. I, I agree simply though. So I'm, I mean, I'm going to be. So, so, so does, I don't know, maybe Columbus wants to get, I, I can give you a bunch of 
what we call soul food in America that is very appealing to African Americans. But I like I like Columbus go first. Yeah, no, you know, I mean, I think I think there's some I think the cultural staples have shifted. But if you're looking at the historical connotation of of soul food, then it ends up being a situation in which um, there is going to be some sort of meaty like type food that that there is typically part of the palate. You're looking at, obviously, the greens, you're looking at some variation of cornbread, you're looking at um, black eyed peas, you're looking at some variation of that, uh, of those things. Unfortunately, a lot of the food is fried and and um, and battered and, and so forth that's there that will scintillate all those senses of salt, sugar, and fat that we're trying to move folks away from. So I think we're really in terms of, from my perspective, when I, depending on who I'm speaking to and their level of engagement, I'm trying to, to match the alternatives as much as possible through air frying, through other slight variants, variations as much as possible, um, increasing the spices in some other aspect so I can decrease them in, from the salt standpoint um, as much as possible, realizing that if they are eating whole food, unprocessed, not boxed, not canned, then I have a little bit more leeway as opposed to the excessive amounts of sodium and uh, preservatives that are contained inside those substances. So it's not so much of that someone of your skill set is not able to can't adopt it and you haven't shown a, many of these types of foods, I think, at all. But I think it's, it's, it's the recognition of the plight. So like, for instance, I, we were on a call this past Friday with a group back in the, the Northeast and the question kind of really came up after we kind of gave them a little bit of an overview of slave food was really about this infusion of a particular brand of stores called Dollar Tree or Dollar General. And they're like, you know, what do you do in a spot like that? Right. And so I had to be honest, I hadn't gone to Dollar Tree. So <laughs> I've never been. So I looked it up. I, I looked it up. I, I looked it up. I looked it up. I've been in the ninety-nine cent store and some other. The same spots. thing. Yeah, same thing. But but you know, but some of it, some of ninety-nine cent, you can find some find some frozen vegetables. You can find oh, of course, things yeah. there. But Dollar Tree, I'm not sure if you can find the same sort yeah. of things. But but it's really trying to tailor them and saying, okay, this is your approach when you're inside this environment. Here's what you have to tap into because I understand the food apartheid state that you're living in in your community. And so how can we make these choices available so you're not having to think about it, right? And explain things to them a little bit simplistically because, you know, they're working and don't have the time to cook. So I think that's really more of, of, of the angle and, and transitioning them over from my perspective. Nice. Well, speaking of food, uh, Angela says, or, uh, excuse me, Stephanie, not Angela, is asking, what, what do you guys like to eat? What do, what do you guys eat like in a day? Uh, I'm very boring, right? So I'll tend to, I tend to have uh, typically salads. I have some version of salads. I tend to do, I'm big on bowls. If anyone's heard me say anything, I'm big yeah. on bowls. It's very simple. <laughs> it's an easy approach. I have my frozen grains inside the freezer. I have, if I'm lazy and I have canned beans, they're salt-free, sugar, uh, salt-free and, and preservative-free. I have my frozen vegetables. I dump those into a bowl. Like if I'm at some sort of uh, a fast food restaurant, I put pico de gallo on top of it, or maybe even I throw on Chef AJ's yummy sauce, right? And I'll have that on there too as well. I may have a baked potato that I throw inside, a bunch of them inside the crock pot beginning of the week. They're all stored inside there. And so I can put chili on there. And then the yummy sauce actually goes very well on top of that there with pico de gallo. So it makes it very simple and practical. I'll pick up a, a package of blueberries and, and blackberries and pomegranate seeds out at and that's, I love the flavor of pomegranate mixed with blueberries and blackberries specifically for that rich antioxidant. The flavor just bursts and it, it explodes in your mouth. I love it, right? So I'm having that. I typically will have a big salad. I'll use hummus as my dressing sometimes with a salad and pico de, de gallo once again. So those are somewhat my staples. I'm, my, my parents are from New Orleans. So it's always about greens of some sort and probably red beans and brown rice or quinoa mixture that's there. And so I tend to have that more times than I don't. It sounds delicious. 
Yeah, for me, I, I you know, coming from a Jamaican background, I really like curries. And so um, my wife they've, they've re- and my mother have really become good at taking vegetables, currying them. So we get okras. I really like okra. And so yesterday we tried our air fryer to make um, fried okra without oil. It, it didn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> I think delicious. I know how you could do that. I actually think I know how you could do that. So. Yeah, because I like fried, but I'm, when I, I never ate okra in my whole life till I went down south to college and somebody gave me fried okra and I was like man oh this okra tastes good but of course it was like like Columbus said it was battered and deep fried so you know it wasn't really okra anymore but um so that, I, that's one of the things I like vegetables I've fallen in love with jackfruit um which is very common in Jamaica of course they wait till it ripes and eat it, eat it sweet but we pull it and make it into things you can stuff tacos with um it's one of my favorite breakfast foods um and, you know, you can make breakfast burritos with them. We do that. I try to eat beans, um, a cup of beans with each meal almost of the, if the two meals I eat a day. And so, um, and also use for dressings on my salads, I put beans, a little bit of guac or straight avocado and some salsa. I, I use beans and salsa and guac on a lot of stuff. So my, my wife often calls me Blacksican because um, I love <laughs> salsa and guacamole so much. But I put a little bit of, just a little bit of guac and then a like good bit of salsa instead of salad dressings and stuff like that. That's kind of, and I put beans and it actually you mix it together. It's like a taco salad every time you eat a salad no matter what mix of greens you use um being jamaican also and goes all the way back to african roots i really like cooked root foods um so yams potatoes in jamaica we say dashin chocho all these great things um yuca is a word that we you use um or cassava in english is probably the way we say it so all those foods are really good i think one of my favorite favorite things are dark grapes blueberries and watermelon and you know I, <laughs> um so when i at nights especially if i want something i try to eat watermelon because it digests super fast but it also hydrates me without me having to drink water um and so i, I eat a, i eat a lot of watermelon and I've, i there's a good study that the yellow watermelon is a little risque so i'll try and say it as clear as nice as possible but the the the, the all not the red but even though the red does it as well but there's a yellow and orange mm-hmm. one that actually improves males function i'll say it just like that that is so funny because my next question was going to be about male function because, you know, we were saying to, to appeal to men of any race, you would think that that would be enough reason in that scene in Game Changers or even when Dr. Mason talked about the canary in the coal mine of Forks Over Knives, that's something that more people should know about. I would think that men would care about that, even if they didn't care about animals or the planet. That men do care about. So yes. you are absolutely <laughs> right. If I if you have a patient and they're on, you know, Viagra, Cialis or something, and you say, hey, you know what? There's a way you could actually probably get these same effects without having to take this pill. Because the problem with the pills is there are time limits on it. And I believe you do, they, I think most patients who use them actually develop some bit of tolerance. I also have a theory that in order to shunt blood where it does, it pulls from elsewhere. So I wonder if one day you don't look back and find that it might actually increase the risk of certain cardiovascular um, um, ischemic issues. But I have no no proof of that at all. I just I just think that it's a, it's a strange thing to do to the body to try and force blood to a place it may not want it. Um, and so uh, watermelon is one thing, but the overall whole food plant-based diet naturally protects against this. Um, and I think I think if more men knew that, more men would give up meat. I, I do, I, and, and go to a whole food plant based diet. We need a camp- yeah. national campaign. <laughs> that sure. that would be that would be an interesting one. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But like- no, I mean also testosterone, right? So your testosterone levels are typically higher when you're yep. off a lot of the animal products too, as well. So you're looking at male virility in general. Your the male function, you're looking at testosterone, all these aspects that are there. I mean, the the, the proof in the pudding, <laughs> so to speak, is pointing towards uh, a whole food plant-based diet, for sure. Yeah. Here's a great question from Zen, who's watching live. My dream is to get this message to African-American churches and help people. How do I approach them? Well, approach us is what I would say. Uh, we'd love to partner with you. If you have the connections for the churches, um, we would actually love to partner. This is something we really want to do and have been doing, um, but we'd love to do a lot more of it because we understand um, uh, there's an excellent series on PBS right now um, on the Black church. Um, and, you know, a lot of times in this day and age, more and more people are less spiritual, you know, and that's, that's obviously fine. 
But it, it, we, it, especially this being Black History Month, you cannot negate the impact that the Black church has had on social justice in this country. In fact, singularly, no institution in America has done more to improve the lives of Americans than the Black church. Not the church in general, the Black church, where people were hosed, dogs bit them, um, they were imprisoned, beaten, trampled upon by horses. I mean, the mm -hmm. things that the, the, those Black Christians in the South went through in order to assure that when someone moves here from India or from South South America and they're dark kiss colored, they're brown skinned, they can sit anywhere in the bus they want, they can go to any restaurant they want, they can go to any hotel they want. There used to be green books, you guys remember. But blacks movie, had to that was a back great movie. Blacks had to you had to have a book to know where it was safe to stop or you could be killed. Um, and the, it was the black church that singularly turned the tide in this country. So, so if you think about it, probably one of the most important institutions to bring a message of, of, of nutrition liberation to is the black church. So we are all in. And in fact, um, if, if there's any group we hope to get to the most, it is the black churches in this country. Yeah, yeah. Just to echo that just a bit more. Uh, well, one thing that's interesting about the Green Book that when we bring it up is that some have hypothesized that that may have been some of the beginnings of why we were such early adopters of, of drive through business, right? Because we were used to having to get our meals, not going into a restaurant, but from a side window mm -hmm. that we had to kind of go from a car and used to eating in a car and all of these other habits that were just layered and passed on gener generationally as well. So there, it, it's steep and this is why it's so important from a historical perspective to understand why some of the practices are in place now and so entrenched in our, our community, although they are inside many other communities as well. But back to the point really about churches, it's churches and one of the things that we were really intentional and in starting to get and in, dive into before COVID were the churches, but also with plans to really reach out to the barbershop. There was a wonderful study that was yes. done that looked at transforming blood pressure elevations, like using blood barbershops and going in and teaching them, but they were focused on medications. But so my idea, our plan was to focus and do these interventions based on nutrition. And we get the lead barbers and we go around and have their blood pressure and lecturing them and guiding them through a health transformation for a specific period of time and showing that yes, indeed, it is possible to transform your community by going to to trust it and reliable sources, the churches, the barbershops, the beauty salons, and having people go there and do it. So there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done, a lot of opportunities um, inside the community. Are you guys familiar with Nathaniel Jordan, the Minister of Wellness? I'm not. Only because he's on the, 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 uh, the series here recently, but I have not heard him. I saw his face and I briefly looked, up, looked him up and saw that he... Uh, goes by the minister of, of wellness right. and I believe he's, he's really passionate about this he says you know going to church will kill you that's what he's saying that they, they gotta do better <laughs> <laughs> guys up seriously that's funny um there, when I lived in Anniston Alabama doing one of my residencies I'll never forget we were talking to one of the older um African-American she was like what we call a, a mother in the church and um we were talking about food for whatever reason and um, you know, I think we were talking about why it's good to stay away from fast food joints. She became very emotional <coughs> and said that she doesn't go to fast food restaurants. Um, and specifically, she doesn't go through drive throughs because in Anniston, which you remember the Freedom Riders when they got off in Anniston, took a pretty bloody beating. It's actually a white young man who got off the bus first, took the brunt of the beating uh, so that everyone else could get away. But she says that they would that you could only get food as a black person through a back window like you could only and she said to this to that day when it was a while ago <clears throat> she would never drive through a drive through for that reason mm. and that resonated with me and it resonated with me even more when the gorilla gardener out of um i think he's mm -hmm. in compton uh he, Ron Henley. Ron Henley, when he said um columbus quoted it earlier when he said um in, you know, there are drive through drive bys and their drive throughs and more people die by the drive-throughs than they do by the drive-bys. That is profound and true. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to get him on the show. Yeah, I love that saying. It's it's so true. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's neat. You guys are just great. I, I think you guys are delightful. I don't know if you can call people delightful. But I just think <laughs> yeah, I think you can. <laughs> I didn't want to it's just I just don't know why just the way that why that word came to me. Let's see. She said, she, yeah. Do you guys have any more questions for either of the doctor? I, I think I love that you guys paired up like this. 
It's, yeah, no, it, it's it's good. You know, one of the things I wanted to highlight that to me it was profound from we, our recent show on Slave Food. So like Chef AJ mentioned, if you follow us on, on Slave Food Project on, on YouTube, it's great. You can watch this series with uh, Jessica B. Harris, a culinary historian. And she spoke really as we, we started asking her, inquiring about, tell us from her perspective about the Middle Passage and about the foods that were eaten there. And so beyond all of the, 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 the particulars about that, the one thing that stuck out to me was she mentioned the one thing that the enslaved had, not the slaves, but the enslaved had, was the power of no, the power of no. And I think that that is something that we have to use in our daily journey, is the power of no, to say no to many of these food substances, to say no to the advertisement, to say no to this community of, of food-like substances that really surrounds us, it tempts us, and it's an area of addiction. And so I think, how do we, how can we break this, this, the chains of addiction? That's really a lot of the heavy work that you've done. You know, Chef AJ is really kind of outlining that yourself, the work of Doug Lyle and others, because it is indeed addictive. It's addictive that we have to break these chains and use the power of no. Right. So it just had, uh, uh, Dr. Walsh, somebody's asking, where in Connecticut are you from? I was actually actually born in Hartford, but I grew up in a town called Bloomfield, <clears throat> which is actually a very athletic town. We I played football there my freshman year. We won a state championship our freshman football team and they, they went on to do great things after that like the football programs and stuff and of course very famous for basketball UConn women's basketball <clears throat> University of Connecticut is probably the probably the great one of the greatest sports stories in American history it doesn't get yeah. enough uh doesn't get enough uh, attention but um of course the guys have done well as well but Bloomfield is my home was my hometown right and and Dr. Batiste somebody's asking if you play the cello <laughs> the, the cello is there, really? like, looks like there's a cello behind you. Oh, that's just a prop. It's just, it's just, it's just uh, an art, uh, art piece. No, I don't. I wish I were talented enough to play the cello or the piano or any of those things. But like every other kid, I fought voraciously against my parents' attempts to get me to play saxophone, clarinet, and piano as a kid wow. growing up. Wow. But you did eat your vegetables. I did eat my vegetables. I did. I followed, I followed some of that. You, you know, I was thinking, you were talking about black churches. It, 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 maybe there could be some kind of a challenge. You know, I know most people don't want to commit to doing things for the rest of their life, but you know how PCRM has those kickstarts. People seem mm -hmm. to be able to do things for 21 days. It's half, half of Lent. Is there a way to just like, I don't know, somehow reach every single pastor in every church and just ask them to do a challenge. You know, I've had a, a Rabbi Shmuley on the show and I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we could just unite all faiths and get the leaders of all those faiths to go vegan for 21 days or 30 days, you know? That would be powerful. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it could be something as easy as the campaign that says the healthiest church in America. The healthiest church in America campaign is seeing, you know, according to markers, a Cardi Mad Bog, who had the greatest weight loss, who had the greatest uh, blood pressure average and all these different things because you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so combining, that was something I tried to do in the microcosm at one or two churches was to try and build and say, okay, we're going to track this and let's see the outcomes over a four week period of time, a six week period of time. Um, and it was successful in, in folks really making a change, but it's something that would be phenomenal on a large scale. And let me say that one of the things black churches often do every January is what we call a yeah. Daniel fast from the book of Daniel chapter one, when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego <clears throat> refused to eat the king of Babylon's meat or drink of his wine. Um, and they did a test and showed themselves to be healthier after 10 days um, of eating like that. And a lot of black churches do that every January. So there are a lot of there's a there's some groundwork where they do something like that, that we could actually grow on in terms of trying to make it more, like you say, make it, make it a little bit more, make, add some longevity uh, to such a practice. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Well, I was gonna let you guys go, but now there's two more questions. But first I wanna read the comment. Thanks to these two wonderful men for educating their patients. They also spend a lot of time on social media, educating and sharing the whole food plant-based life. They do, which is why all I've asked you guys to do is please click the link and subscribe to their YouTube channel. It just takes like one second. So come on, let's do it. So uh, Bryant says, could you please ask them if they would be willing to talk to my pre-med colleagues in one of our weekly meetings? As a future doctor, I've been doing my best to cultivate more plant-based doctors. Absolutely, absolutely. They can, um, so Brian, can, you can reach out to us. 
uh, via the platform, obviously on slatefood.org or on on social media, uh, the Healthy Heart Doc, and connect, and then we can connect and try and uh, match up our schedules and see exactly what he's looking at. But always happy to happy to do that. Great, thanks. And then an, a question: A male African American friend of mine recently turned his type two diabetes around and no longer needs meds, but he's just been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Do you know anyone who has reversed Parkinson's with a whole food plant based lifestyle? I do not. I do not um, know specifically as it pertains to Parkinson's and whole food plant-based um, eating. But we know it for sure. It's not harmful. We know it can only aid in terms of um, all health aspects. But we certainly, I can't, I can't espouse that it will will reverse that based on my awareness right now. And I also saw something just recently on intermittent fasting. It being protective in such uh, neurodegenerative disorders um, and may even um, cause some neurogenesis. So again, I, I haven't seen it and I've only, I just read something about it, but it might be, might be worthwhile for that person to do some, to, to, to do some intermittent fasting just because it wouldn't hurt at all. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to hook you guys up with Nathaniel Jordan because I think with the three of you together, there's there's no, going to be no stopping you. He he's very passionate. I'm well, not that you guys aren't, but I mean he's he's like he's like more like a like he, you guys like he does fire and brimstone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, you know, I know you guys as medical doctors, like you would never say to a patient with a heart attack, well, it's your own fault because you ate crap. Like he probably would, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's, he's not, he does not mince words. And so I, I really, I really appreciate the way he, 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 I think you guys will like him. All right. Just I'm like, sure yeah. if you, if, if you, if you like, uh, if you like anybody, I know I'm going to like, well, we had him on the summit, really you know, like and, 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 and he got, he got really, he, he fires people up. He really does. You know, that's, so that's great that's, stuff. No, I'd love to connect with him too. That'd as well. be great. Well, thank you guys. It was so great having you again. And guys, please just subscribe to their YouTube channel. It takes a second. Boom, click the button because we want to get them to 2000 today because I promised them. And if, you know, I don't like to break my promises. So thanks so much for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Come back tomorrow when we have Dr. Heather Woolery Lloyd. She is not only a dermatologist, but she's also certified in lifestyle medicine. Thanks again, guys. Take care. All right. Take care.